Scott. Danny Thomas is here tonight, and Danny... Danny has had major success in every facet of show business, from nightclubs to motion pictures to television, and is coming Monday night, May 28th. He'll be hosting a telethon, if you know, his places he practically started and is still supplies a major support to St. Jude's Hospital, and it's going to be televised in New York and the eastern regional states starting at 8 p.m. this coming Monday night. Would you welcome, please, Danny Thomas. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> Have you been in show business a long time? Yep. Mm -hmm. I suppose you were pretty excited the first time you appeared in front of an audience. Nope. Nope. <laughs> I was trying to figure out questions. I found my, wasn't he wonderful? I found oh, myself well, falling into that doing. trap where I could only ask questions for yes or no, and I don't want to expect anything to say. Can you imagine five, five years old? It's really great. Yeah, for fun. Sensational. Do you remember when you were five years old? We had a pool room. Did you really? Yeah, and I used to fool around, shoot pool and stuff like that when I was a kid. Were you any good? Fair. Yeah. But I got uh, better when I grew up, and then uh, I met Joey Bishop. Uh-huh. Who uh, said, I would like to have you on a slow boat to China because uh, oh. you uh, do not stroke. <laughs> you were a pigeon? <laughs> were, I, I, <laughs> were you a pigeon for him? Oh, such a food. I had him by 17 balls in a <coughs> 50 ball game, and he beat me. There's some good players in our business, I think, who grew up and is in a neighborhood where, you know, you go around and they pick up a few bucks. And sure. could really, and really, you have to know how to hustle, though, don't you? You can't look, start off looking too proficient. No, no, you, 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 well, of course, that's the come on. You blow the first couple of games and then you say, well, let's, re let's play for something. Maybe that'll help me a little bit. And, uh -huh. and they do that. There are a lot of hustlers around. People may, 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 may live and play in pool for a long time, but I never did. I never did that. Right. It just, uh, I say, I, I seriously played Joey, but you see, he's so fast. He's good. He, he's in the mind right. so fast. He'll just drive you out of your mind, you know, and he makes fun of you. He, and, and I'm a big patsy with him. I tell you a time, we were in the Bob Hope uh, Desert Classic, and it was 7 o'clock in the morning, and we were going to tee off at 8, and you got to practice a little bit, right? And if, I don't care, Palm Springs or Palm Beach, 7 o'clock in the morning, it's cold. So I went over, and I got a bucket of balls, and so did he. Now, I got my clubs there, and my pro said to me, uh, keep both feet together and kind of crack the vertebrae if you, when you hit a few times before you really take your stance. So I'm doing that, and my fingers were so cold. And I swung, and the seven iron went 58 <laughs> feet. <laughs> and I looked up, and there he was looking at me. He said, what do you care? With your money, get yourself another bucket of clubs. <laughs> <laughs> bucket of clubs? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> bucket of clubs. Who did, the, who did the famous joke? I think I attribute it to Phil Harris or something like that, or maybe it was Hal March. It's a golf story. Yeah. When they were playing and somebody, let's say it was Phil Harris, and Hal March was teeing off and put the ball down, and he whiffed it, which means miss it completely. Took another shot at it, that never touched the ball. And the third time, he hits the ball and shanks it off about 75 yards. As they walk away from the tee, Phil says, Hal, you forgot your lucky tee. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I don't know who did that, but it's another it's one of those great stories. There's a lot of great uh, stories. I, I played with Gerald Ford, president, former president. Ford plays in, in our tournament in Memphis every year. He's coming. One year got a hole in one, you know. He wasn't looking with a five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he had the ball there. There, You know, Spiro Agnew was famous for hitting people. Well, right. Jerry Ford hit himself. He sprays them pretty good, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. All over the place. And the poor caddy is going all over. And now he's got the ball on the putting green. And he says to the caddy, how do you think I should hit this? And the caddy said, keep it low. <laughs> I never heard that. That's no, wonderful. Was, keep it keep low. Keep it low. <laughs> I loved it. What was the, the, we're going back reminiscing stories, which are good because you, you're one of the great storytellers of all well, times. Who was I? This goes back, I think, to almost Walter Hageners on those days or something. And some guy was out doing terrible things, and he turned to the caddy after this horrendous shot and says, how would you have played that? And the caddy said, under an assumed name. <laughs> now, there, there's some very funny caddies out there, or they got well, great writers. Well, there, there are stories that they claim they're true. Uh, in a practice round, they say, Arnie, this man, I don't know who the pro was, 
but he hit his drive, and then he said, uh, no, he, what did uh, Arnold Palmer use off this tee? And he, remember, you know, sir? Yeah, I think, it's ahead. supposed to be a true story. He said a three wood. So the guy, this pro, hit the, with a three wood. And pretty fair shot out there in the middle of the fairway. And then he said to the caddy, he's a black kid, by the way, he said, uh, what uh, did Mr. Palmer use here? He said, a three iron. He said, you sure? That's what Mr. Palmer used, three iron. And he hit it with a three iron. He's 50 feet short of the green. He said, I thought you told me Arnold Palmer hit it with a three iron. He said, he did. And he said, but I'm 50 feet short of the green. He said, so was he. <laughs> I remember you, when I first saw you years ago, and I don't know if it was in Chicago or someplace, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a certain knack to telling stories that, well, that have a lot of background and character and color you to gotta them. Be, you got to be, I think, from the street. Because a lot of them come from ethnic backgrounds. They really come from the street, the stories. Right. And there are all, all sorts of them. I, I ran into a, a butte, and I don't know how much time you've got. But Go ahead. You know, I'm... Uh, 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 allegedly religious, as you seem to point out, you and Bob Hope. Uh, you, were, you were praying in the green room just I, before you I came out. I was praying in the green room, praying that, uh, <laughs> that you would miss every shot. <laughs> no, but, you know, uh, Bob, but now uh, Red Buttons has joined the parade. You know, they, you all know that I have stained glass windows in my car. That came from Carson and Bob Hope. <laughs> you, you do know that... Uh, uh, well, Red Buttons, I think, came up with the classiest I ever heard in my life. He said, I'm the only Catholic in the world who had himself cloned so he could hear his own confession. <laughs> <laughs> that I like. Now, that's that pretty like. classy. That's wonderful. But because of this religious aura that's been around me, and glory be, you've got to know that no man in his right mind is going to stand up and say, I'm religious, or I'm good, or I'm great, or... Uh, or a legend in my own mind, like he said. <laughs> oh. He says, Danny Thomas, a legend in his own mind. <laughs> oh, you're a great friend. Sweet, sweet. I, I was going to tell the whole world how marvelous you were on the Oscar show. Of course, they saw it, but I never did get a chance oh, to tell you, Percy. You, you were really, wasn't he sensational? Thank you. Thank you. Well, you see the corner over there, No. He means you want, to do, you want to do the commercial before Danny does the story. Oh, all right. Well, we got time for the story, but we want to All right, fine. We'll do this first, and we'll be right back. There you go. If you're a man, then you can't afford to miss this announcement. Because as we get older, we may have to deal with the signs of an aging prostate. Okay, storytelling time. Well, I mean, uh, I got on telling uh, uh, story, religious stories, or religious type stories, because of you and Bob and Red and others. And there, there are a lot of cuties. I mean, I think, I don't know if I, at St. John's Hospital, one of the nuns was screaming, running down the hallway, absolutely hysterical. And, and the nurse uh, ran up to the doctor who had treated her, Dr. Rubin, and she said, D Dr. Rubin, what's the matter with Sister Elizabeth? She seems hysterical. And he said, yes, I just told her she's pregnant. And she said, glory be to God. And she said, no, but it sure cured her hiccup. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he's like, yeah. But I got to tell you the classic religious story of all time, because there are, they, I, they claim it's true. I don't know. There's a reverend, a, a reverend for a name, a reverend Johnson from a Midwestern town who addressed the Rotary Club, uh, clubs of America, the International Rotary, 2,000 men. And he gave a speech on sex, sex education, the promiscuity of the times, the venereal disease, the unwanted pregnancies, etc., and what to do about it. It was a marvelous speech. And he got a double standing ovation. Now, he went back home to his wife, and his wife is the absolute quintessence of Puritanism. She is Victorian beyond Victorian. She wears a dress all the way up to here with a cameo pin and uh, all the way down to her energetic shoes. And, and, and she is absolutely as prudish as prudish could be. And she said to him, Henry, how did the talk go? He said, rather well, Martha, thank you. She said, that's fine. What did you talk about? Now, no way could this man bring himself to say to this Miss Goody Two-Shoes of the world that he spoke on sex, no matter how he qualified it, like uh, Hayakawa. He can't right. qualify, right? So he finally said to her, oh, uh, I spoke on... Uh, 
sailing and yachting. She said, oh, that's nice. So a couple of days later, she was in the marketplace, Mrs. Johnson. One of the Rotarians saw her. And he said, oh, Mrs. Johnson, the Reverend gave a fantastic talk at Rhodes. She said, yes, I understand it went down very well. But I was a bit surprised at his subject matter. He's only tried it twice. <laughs> And uh, she said, the first time, he threw up. <laughs> and the second time, his hat blew off. <laughs> yeah, by the premise, you buy the joke. <laughs> How many years has it been uh, since you, and I'm not going to ask you to do it, but. the Jack story is associated with you the, uh, for years and years, and people use it who don't even know what the story is. You know, I've heard them say, let's don't play the Jack story. You know, they'll get in the thing and say, well, let's don't look far ahead. And It came out of, it's, <coughs> it's, uh, I last told it in 1962. And the reason I don't tell it anymore is because we are loaded, with, I mean, we've got two generations of kids and young people who have not seen the two-lane highway, car right. coming this way and this lane, you going that way. Right. We, we've got CBs today. We've got freeways. So We've got so telephones. Outdated, right? The whole thing is that you would have to spend... It's bad enough I take so much time to build up a story anyway. <laughs> oh, you have Jackie Miles said about me? I, we know the thing about you say two Jews got off a streetcar. Jackie Miles said, Danny Thomas would say, in the year of our Lord, 1957, two gentlemen of the Jewish persuasion, persuasion. stepped from a public vehicle, you know. <laughs> because he said, I go that way. But, but anyway... You can't tell the Jack story. You can't take you too long yeah. to explain. It's a country road. This poor guy, this old Jewish man, has a flat tire, doesn't have a jack, and a, and a, and a, a motorist, come, a farmer comes by, says there's a garage, a bus stop two blocks or two miles up the road. If you can get to it, the fellow rents a jack, and he leaves them. And now he starts to walk, and as he's walking, he is musing, and invariably people who walk alone in the dark will talk to themselves, and that's what this guy did. However, the origin... The origin is an, it's an Irish story. Right. And I'll tell it to you if you want, if you got time. It's an, oh, yeah. Now that I got you in, Joe. Yeah, you have, that which one is No. Now that I got you in, Slow it. burn, slow burn is what it's all about. Anticipation is always better or worse than, you know, than, than consummation in any event. <laughs> what I love about this story is that, why well, is the word consummation, does that mean something to somebody <laughs> in the you're dirty-minded people. <laughs> now, what I love about this concept, and it's pure Irish humor, that the, the dialogue, the monologue, never changes. Pat says to his wife, um, I would mow the lawn, but the lawnmower is broken. So I'll go over to Mike's, and I'll borrow his lawnmower. And she said, that cheapskate, he wouldn't loan you to sweat from under his arms. <laughs> he said, how can you say that? Glory be to God, we're married to sisters. We come over in the same boat together. And when times were tough, I loaned him the $10 that time for groceries and stuff. And he's not gonna loan me the lawnmower? You must be out of your mind. That's a terrible thing to say. And he gets his straw hat and he's walking down the street. He says, glory be to God. That's a woman's mind for you. I mean, we come over in the same boat together. We're married to sisters. <laughs> At the time, he needed a little help. I loaned him the $10, and he's not going to loan me the lawnmower. <laughs> That's a beaut, that is. I mean, a fellow comes over in the same boat with you, and you're married to sisters, and you loan him $10 when times are tough, and he's not going to loan you the lawnmower? <laughs> I mean, we come over in the same boat together. <laughs> <laughs> and we're married to sisters, and I loaned him the $10 that time. And, I, and he wouldn't loan me the lawnmower. I mean, we're married to sisters and came over in the same boat together. And I gave him the $10 to get to the door and rings the doorbell. And uh, Mike says, Pat, how are you? What can I do for you? Says, what can you do for me? You can take your damn lawnmower and shove it right up your chalet. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly That's right. 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 Oh. Anticipation. So even now, yeah. even now when people talk about, you know, don't plan ahead or don't, don't do the ending before it's there. They always say, let's don't play the Jack story. That's right. They've said that's it exactly years. what they're talking about. Yeah. And I've heard people use it and say, you know, I know what it means, but I've never heard the story. 
<laughs> you know, they say, don't play the Jack story. A lot but... of young people ask yeah. me to tell it, but honestly, I, if I told it now, there would be, I'm not going to tell it naturally, but there, I swore I'd never tell it. There would be like mild chuckles. Incidentally, it, in this country, the guy was going to get his trombone out of hockey at a gig that night. <laughs> and he, and he owed $5 on the trombone. And he said to his buddy, I'm going to get the trombone from Uncle Jake. I know he'll give it to me. And after the gig, I pay him the $5. And the guy told him the same thing. And that uh, in Flint, he won't give it to you. And he's walking and does the same thing. How, how many times he's hawked <laughs> with Uncle Jake and so forth. And when he got there, you know what he told him to do with the trombone. Take the trombone and do it. We'll take a same break. Story. We'll be right back. In conjunction uh, with your telethon, there was a, quite a, a good article in Look Magazine this week, which I think may have just come out. I mean, got yeah, the Look copy. is just on the stands now, and we got, we got a break a couple of weeks ago on People's. And by the way, I was telling you before, I saw your cover picture for the Saturday Evening Post before you did. That's what you mentioned. I was in Indianapolis with Dr. Uh, Corey Savas. She's a marvelous lady. Right. And uh, she is going to do a, a big, big story on St. Jude's. We're getting a lot of publicity now, which we don't pay for. Right. See, we collect money to save kids' lives, and I just want you to know that I appreciate very much your having me as a guest tonight and giving me this kind of time, you and Ed, and of course, Freddie DeCorda was a producer, because it's important. The news is, and it's just been let out about a month ago, that lymphocytic leukemia is definitely curable. Now, that's something that medical science has never dared say before, but out of 639 kids, we now know that 40 some odd percent of them cannot possibly have the disease anymore. They haven't got it, they're cured. And we think by the end of the year, it's gonna go 75, 80%. And that's what these telethons are about. That's why I keep before the public and over the Memorial Day, uh, May 28th for five hours, Bob Hope's gonna be there. And- uh, It's Monday night, right? That's it's Monday night, Monday. yeah. In, in the greater New York area, Boston, all of New Jersey, right. all that part of the country. And uh, Tony Orlando is gonna co-host with me, Tony Iola, bunch of the guys, they'll all be there. And uh, I hope that the folks who love you in that, they love you everywhere, but in that area especially, will respond to this appeal to please watch the telethon and know full well that 90% of the money, at least 90% of what you pledge will go directly to Memphis, Tennessee, the world's greatest, largest, and in fact, the only complete cancer research center for children, complete in the whole world. And it services the whole world, everywhere. everywhere. And it's free. It's free. Also, and it's free. Nobody can do Thank you, Dan. Oh, speaking of raising funds for uh, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Do you know where your wife is? You just told me a moment ago. <laughs> She's yes. with my wife. And they're out with a bunch of ladies. Boy, the power of the women. Yes. And I don't know why they're fighting for equality. Why would they want to step down? I'll tell you, they are powerful. <laughs> they are powerful. <laughs> and uh, Joanna and uh, my Rosemary and a whole group of people are right. over at Gatsby's right now uh, telling the press all about the big telethon that we're going to have here in this area on uh, July 8th. Super. Well, yeah. I, hope, I hope it's a big success. It will be. It will be. It can't fail anymore. These marvelous articles that are coming out in all these magazines and the great stories that are coming out in the pediatrics journals. And please, God, I would just like to see, before I die, for our scientists to find the cause of one of those cancers. We've stopped a lot of cancers, Johnny, right. but we don't know why. You know, we can't see it. One day we will. And then we'll say, that's it, goodbye, Charlie. Cut a brain, stroke, and it's over. That's yeah. it. That'll be a lovely day. Yes, it sure will. Sure Thank you, will. Danny. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. <laughs> Danny, I know you're going to watch because you're going to join the, the gals over there and yes, talk about this. Yes, they're going to go to see your wife and mine and uh, some of the press before they get away. I, I thank you again. Oh. I know that you you stretch it a little bit tonight. Hey, come on. To give me a chance to tell everybody about what we're doing, and I appreciate it, Johnny. God bless thank you. Thank you, Dad.